Welcome to Math 31. This is a lesson on the chain rule. Chain rule is a big deal. It um, is used probably as much or more than any other differentiation method that you've covered to date and will. So it shows up in all sorts of different ways and in fact it happens eventually and you don't even realize you're doing the chain rule on it. Its principal purpose is to differentiate composite functions. Now composite functions sometimes announce themselves as being composite functions and other times they do not. And um, a composite function can be viewed a number of ways but think back to what we did in pre-calculus and it might occur to you that it's equal to a function like this. f at g at x. So in other words, there's one function substituted into another function. So if y is a function of u and u is a function of x in this statement, would describe that situation. Y is equal to f at u at x. So I'm using different notation, but that's standard actually for these is to use the variable u. And now given this, then this statement would be true, and it's a very important one. The chain rule can really be expressed in this, this uh, equation. dy dx, the derivative of the y function with respect to the innermost variable x, is equal to the derivative of the y function with respect to the u variable multiplied by the derivative of u with respect to x. Now, um, put a little box around it because it's so important. Another way to look at it, and this is less common, at least it's less common for me, I rarely use this form, but it is correct. The derivative, using that derivative operator of the function f at u at x is equal to the derivative of the outer, so f prime u at x, multiplied by the derivative of the inner. And that's really what we do with these. So u prime at x. You start on the outer function, differentiate it, and you multiply it by the derivative of the inner function. So it's used in any situation where there is really more than one operation in, uh, in play. So for y is equal to 2x minus 1 to the 5, now you don't think about this question too much about how do you differentiate it, but in fact it'd be a problem. You could expand it, multiply it by itself five times, and then just deal, deal with it as a polynomial. But otherwise, because you, um, you've got this exponent to the 5, because there's, there's two operations. You've got, you're taking the x variable, you're multiplying it by 2 and subtracting 1, and then that's one function. The other function is you're taking this expression and raising it to the exponent of 5. Now, there's two methods to deal with that, and one, both have their, ma have their advantages. I will favor one for most algebraic type things we run into, but there, there, we will expand that later on. The one is to do it strictly by the book. It's a nice idea to start off with this simply because it, it gives you a, a clear sense of what the chain rule is all about. Some people always use this method. So what I do is I go u is equal to 2x minus 1. And then using Leibniz notation, I differentiate this inner function, du dx, which is equal to 2, because it's the derivative of u with respect to x. And then the other function in play, then, would be y is equal to u to the exponent of 5. And then the derivative of y with respect to u is equal to 5 u to the 4. And then you recall that the chain rule states that dy dx, the derivative of y with respect to x, is equal to the derivative of y with respect to u multiplied by the derivative of u with respect to x. Now, people look at the chain rule like this and they think, aha, what you're doing is you're canceling or dividing out the du's, leaving you with dy dx. And it's a nice idea because it looks right. In fact, you're not doing it. These aren't quotients. dy du is a, is a symbol saying the derivative of u with respect to derivative of y with respect to u. It's not dy divided by du. So you're really not canceling out like that. However, I will say that it does look that way and it's a nice way to, you can set them up on that basis as long as you're clear in your mind that you're really not canceling out. Now the next thing we get then is dy dx 
our substitute we'll replace back in dy du is 5u to the 4 and then dy du dx is 2 so therefore dx or dy dx is equal to 5 times 2 is 10 and then the u to the 4 replace the u back with 2x minus 1 and then this is to the exponent of 4. So it's a nice way to do it. However, the way I'm going to generally do these ones is a more direct way that uses the chain rule but it avoids at writing, out, writing it out. And with this, uh, this method, so I'll even say this is favored I take that expression y is equal to 2x minus 1 to the exponent of 5 and to differentiate it I do not use this substitution I just go dy dx and I go outer to inner so I I deal with the 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 2x minus 1 to the 5 first, this exponent of this uh, function of something to the exponent of 5. So it goes 5 times 2x minus 1 to the 4. And then I take the derivative of the inner. So it's always outer to inner. So d dx 2x minus 1. And then dy dx is equal to 5 times 2x minus 1 to the 4 multiplied by the derivative of that which is 2 so dy dx is equal to 10 times 2x minus 1 to the 4 so it takes us to the same place now eventually people will eliminate that middle step I'm going to include it for a while because one of the risks with this method the second method is that you forget to take the derivative of the inner and so I'm going to keep writing d dx for that factor for a while just to remind myself that I must take it and then once I actually do differentiate it then it's uh, it goes away because that is probably the most common mistake with this type of problem let's try a few more now I'm going to go directly to the second method so this function, to get the derivative, so any time you've got something where you have this a bracketed expression with an exponent, it has to be a chain rule to do this. Uh, it, there's, just, there's just no other way that you can deal with that because you don't have individual terms to work with. It's always outer to inner. So the derivative is 3 multiplied by 2x to the 3 plus 11x to the 2 multiplied by the derivative of the inner, so d dx of 2x to the 3 plus 11x. And then I work my way down. The derivative of the inner is 6x squared plus 11. And then that is going to be multiplied by 3 times 2x cubed plus 11x to the 2. Now then you have to decide, well, can I do more? And in fact, in this case, not really. You can multiply the 3 in, but there's no advantage to doing it. So leave it like that. And more likely, you would, if there was a number to factor out from the 6x squared plus 11, you would, now that it does not have an exponent. So it works well, and that's the chain rule. So let's do a few more and get really comfortable with what, uh, what lies in front of us. Number three, y is equal to 1 divided by x squared plus 2x plus 2. Now the thing of it is with this problem, some of you correctly will use the quotient rule on this. And it will work because it's 1 divided by this. But this is a case where you'd be better off not doing that. Instead, recognizing that this can be written as x squared plus 2x plus 2 to the exponent of negative 1. This works better. So you're not really using any of the 
you know, like a quotient rule, which is kind of, um, you know, it's got lots going on with it, even though it would simplify quickly. So y is equal to 2x squared plus 2x plus 2 to the negative 1. So the derivative of this function, y, dy dx, is equal to negative x squared plus 2x plus 2 subtract 1 is negative 2 multiplied by the derivative of the inner which is x squared plus 2x plus 2 and then this becomes 2x plus 2 multiplied by negative x squared plus 2x plus 2 to the negative 2. Now you need to be aware of, again, of different forms for writing your answer. This is technically correct. Um, there's nothing that can be cancelled or reduced further with it. However, if you did write this with a positive exponent, you could then take that x squared plus 2x plus 2 to the 2 on the bottom, and then the negative could stay on top. And then if you factor it out a 2, you'd get x plus 1. So that's what you're going to see more often. And unless the question says put it with positive exponents, it's not wrong to keep it in the other form. However, you're more likely to see it written in the second form. And, you know, if it's on an exam, I wouldn't take any marks off for the original. But most people are just kind of at this stage trained to factor out, say, a 2 and uh, deal with the positive expo negative exponents that way. Number four, pause me if you want to go through these on your own. They're all good practice. Y is equal to, now be careful with this, because you've got 7x plus 2 to the exponent, this is the cube root of all of that. So this is to the one-third, but the negative one-third, because I'm bringing it to the top. So dy dx is equal to negative one-third multiplied by 7x plus 2 subtract 3 over 3 gives us negative 4 thirds multiplied by the derivative of the inner which is 7x plus 2. The derivative of the inner is just 7. So dy dx is equal to negative 1 third times 7x plus 2 to the negative four-thirds. And then you should always, of course, combine any straggler terms you have in front. Seven times negative one-third is negative seven-thirds. And then seven x plus two to the negative four-thirds. So you want to keep your work nice and organized with this. and. Um, this is okay. This, in fact, because you got the fractional exponent, is uh, a good way to write it. But you could. There's no perfect way with those. You could also write it like this: the seven x plus two to the four thirds on the bottom. The three is on the bottom, and then the, all you've got on top is negative seven. Now let's do a couple more that will will um, actually more than a couple more that will illustrate a couple a few other points. This is something that comes up a bit because we're going to be dealing in the next lesson what with what is called combined rules, where you're having to use the product rule or the quotient rule in conjunction with the chain rule. But um, and then this is a case that uh, you'll see this one tomorrow or the next class, and you think, well, that's what I should do. But we don't have to. See, the issue with this problem is the 2 in front. And when we take the derivative of this expression, because there's no variable term with the 2, we can just treat it as per usual with the chain rule. That is, differentiate the outer. 4 times 2 is 8, multiplied by 3x squared minus 5x to the 3, 
this would be times the derivative of the inner, which is 3x squared minus 5x. And then this is 6x minus 5. So dy dx is equal to 8 times 3x squared minus 5x to the 3. And I don't think there's anything more we can do. We can't factor out anything from that term or from that um, 6x minus 5 binomial, so I'm satisfied. So that 2 is just a passenger, just like it would be on a regular differentiation question. Next one is really similar. Could use the, the um, quotient rule with this. I'm not going to. I'll write this as negative 3 and then 5x squared minus 3x to the negative 1 half. So square root would be to the 1 half. So dy dx is equal to negative 3 times negative 1 half is 3 over 2 multiplied by 5x squared minus 3x. Subtract 1 will take you to negative 3 over 2, subtract 2 over 2, multiplied by the derivative of the inner, which is 5x squared minus 3x. That will give you 10x minus 3. And then the rest of it just carries right down. So dy dx is equal to 3 over 2 multiplied by 5x squared minus 3x to the exponent of negative 3 over 2. Or the 10x minus 3 will be on top. There's a 3 there and then a 2 on the bottom and then 5x squared minus 3x to the 3 halves on the bottom. The number 7, the last one of this sort that I'll do, is noteworthy because you've actually got um, three functions that are working. Because this really is squ uh, 1 plus x to the 1 half, all of this to the 1 half. So the what's going on is we start with an x value, we take a square root of it, that's the first function. We add 1 to it, that's the second function. We take the square root of it now, that's the third fun uh, function. So we've got three functions going on. So this would be dy dx is equal to dy du times du dk times dk dx if you want to insert the 3. But I'm going to stick with it without substitution. Substitutions work and at some point most people turn to them. But I'm just going to very carefully go outer to inner. So I get 1 half times 1 plus x to the 1 half to the negative, subtract 1, would be to the negative 1 half. And then I note that I am now taking the derivative of the inner function, which is 1 plus x to the 1 half. Now, I take the derivative of the this inner function. Now, the derivative of 1 is 0. So x to the 1 half would become 1 half x to the negative one-half. Now we don't need to go further simply because this, um, you know, there's no more brackets to, to take apart. So dy dx is equal to one-half multiplied by, so carry that first part down, one plus x to the one-half to the negative one-half multiplied by that expression. Now we have one half times one half is one quarter. So we need to clean it up and get one quarter times one plus x to the one half 
to the negative one half multiplied by x to the negative one half. Now while that's correct, you may prefer to deal with your negative exponents. So this would then become the fours on the bottom, the one plus x to the one half is on the bottom, to the positive one half, and then x to the one half there, and then the one on top. Now while that is also correct, you will often see this in answer keys with it being back in radical form. Now, the thing is with radical form, the kind of the rough rule, and I think I've mentioned it before, is that with the variables you tend to use exponential form because you can differentiate them and, and work with them better. And um, so this is fine what we have, but when there's square roots, because they're so, and that's what it comes down to, just sort of convenience. Square roots are easy to work with. So if you see x to the one half, a lot of people will write that as four square root x. I'll bring that to the front, multiplied by the square root of one plus square root x. I think I've got it all there. So that's uh, that would be a good choice for that. Now we're going to do more complicated ones like this in a bit but this is a good starter one. Two more questions, and these are just kind of variations of chain rule where we have to use substitutions, or they're designed for that. So y is equal to 2u cubed plus 3u squared. u is equal to x plus 1 over x, and we want to get dy dx. So off to the side, I'm going to do all the differentiation that I need to. dy du, based on this one, is 6u squared plus 6u. The u is equal to 1 plus x to the negative 1. So therefore du dx is equal to, well, derivative of 1 is 0, so x to the negative 1 is negative x to the negative 2. And then you recall dy dx is equal to dy du times du dx. And then we just sub everything in. So dy dx is equal to 6u squared plus 6u multiplied by negative x to the negative 2. Then we do have to um, make our substitution. So we got 6u squared, because we want this one as a function of x, not as a function of u. So u squared is going to be x plus 1 over x, doesn't matter which version you enter it in, squared plus 6 times x plus 1 over x multiplied by negative x to the negative 2. Now I want to go a little further with this because it's not good to write these things with that negative term at the tail end of it. So take the negative to the front and then we'll get negative 6 times x plus 1 over x squared plus 6 times x plus 1 over x and then the other thing is that x to the negative 2 could come to the bottom and become x to the positive 2. So I do want you to get comfortable with different versions of the same answer because it is a, it's an issue that you grapple with. It begins to make more sense as you get better and better and, and with these ones or as you work towards per, a purpose more because you will find that you do certain things for a certain reason. It's not just an arbitrary thing where you simplify. You're trying to set it up so that whatever the next step is, you can do that next step easier. Whereas now it just seems like you're doing constantly changing the form. Let's just do one more, and I, let's call it a day. Here, we want to get dy dx. 
So pause me and go through it. dy du is equal to 1 sixth times 3, which is 1 half u squared. Then du dv is equal to 2v. Now v, keep in mind, is equal to 1 minus 2x to the negative 1 half. So dv dx is equal to, well, negative 2 times negative 1 half is positive 1, and then we get x to the negative 3 halves. So that's kind of good. So dy dx is equal to dy du multiplied by du dv multiplied by dv dx. And so even though we're not supposed to do it, you can see that in terms of pairing these ones up right, if you did think that you were canceling, you'd be left with dy dx, which is what we want. So dy dx is equal to dy du, which is 1 half u squared, times du dv, which is 2v, times dv dx, which is x to the negative 3 halves. So this one really cleans up well, because those 2's are going to go away on us. And we end up with u squared times v times x to the negative 3 halves. And then we can make our substitutions in and then do whatever mopping up needs to be done. dy dx is equal to u squared, so that's 16 plus v squared. Okay, now then v, or six, um, 16 plus v squared. Um, okay, so the u squared, oh, there we are. 16 plus v squared. I'm going to write it in one step first off and then multiplied by v, which is 1 minus 2 over root x. Now, I missed the substitution there, so I'll have to get it next time. And then times x to the negative 3 halves. So these are always a bit of a pain to wrap up. But I'm nearly there. So 16 plus v squared is going to be 16 plus 1 minus 2 over root x, all squared. This multiplied by 1 minus 2 over root x, and then multiplied by x to the negative 3 halves. Now this one, in terms of simplification, presents us with an interesting problem. You've got all these denominators, which you don't normally like to have, and so do you get rid of them? or not. I'm going to keep them the way it is. This is going to be a messy expression no matter what we do with it. So this is good enough. And even though we have x to the negative 3 halves, so we could write that in the bottom, then we've got a complex fraction. So I'll keep it in this way. I'll, I'll use that sort of discretionary choice that I have. So I'm going to stop for now. Um, the next lesson will be on combining the chain rule with others, other operations. But uh, this is a good start on chain rule problems. So thank you for your time.